just a few remarks on how to think about what's happening in American politics. Uh, it's uh, just a open preliminary comments um, to begin a, perhaps a thought process and discussion. Uh, a lot of it is drawn in some detail from chapter eight of the book that I wrote, uh, which discusses the American enterprise, uh, uh, and then apply it to the particular details of our contemporary situation. Uh, so I think the part of the, so part of the issue is to try and place what is happening today in a little context with respect to the background and the culture of American of America. America begins as a nation in a process of of um, uh, the it, we, we we can talk about discovery, but the in the uh, vast migration of people primarily from Europe coming to a so-called new world. Right? Not necessarily new for the people who are already here, who didn't feel they needed to be discovered, but in that process they confronted a more or less, more or less empty continent. It's often been said that they didn't so much discover a wilderness as make one, uh, as a function primarily of the diseases that were brought over by Europeans into the New World for which the native population was highly susceptible having not been uh, 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 having not been exposed to those over eons and eons of time by which they could have developed the appropriate resistances as the Europeans had. So uh, uh, the primary function was the death that took place of vast numbers of Native Americans. Uh, it's generally thought for example that in the when the Europeans first came to the New World in North America in uh, the end of the 15th and beginning of 16th century they encountered a native population of something on the order of 60 million and within within 50 years that population was down to 5 million. Uh, that was not primarily from murder but from the ravaging of diseases. Um, but in any case from the point of view of the population that came from Europe primarily Right. They encountered a more or less open continent with unbelievable resources right, because of the nature of the, the spread of the continent, both east, west, and north, south, the variation of the climates, the tremendous amount of resources. It was literally a world of tremendous potential and opportunity. Right. And the people who came tended to be people on the make and on the move, as it were often ones who were rejected or defeated from the previous conditions, second, second sons who couldn't make it on their own because of primogenitor in Europe, in which all the wealth goes to the first son, uh, people, who, uh, uh, people who, who were squeezed because economic or religious. I mean, there are a whole range of reasons why people would pick up from their native lands, and, but it's all, almost invariably the most energetic, uh, the most uh, um, uh, motivated, as it were, uh, the most driven or pushed. There was a push, there was a pull factor. Uh, people don't generally pick up and leave their native uh, situation unless situations become increasingly intolerable. Right? But the most energetic are the ones who often do it. Uh, it is not an easy process. Right? So, but in, take, so you have, uh, you have uh, an, uh, an more or less educated um, immigrant population coming into a more or less undeveloped environment with great potential resources and more or less without, so they come from a feudal Europe which is relatively clearly constrained and, and structured and limited to the possibilities, the, the available land, the available resources, the class structure, and they come into a world in which none of that exists really. Right? There is, there is un, more or less unlimited land. Right? There are none of the feudal restrictions in, the, in place. And insofar as there was an effort on the part of the establishment, for example in New England, right, to reestablish those restrictions, whether in the Puritan sense to reestablish them on religious terms, right, or in Virginia to reestablish them more or less in economic terms with respect to the, the, uh, the uh, corporation that was running Virginia, they basically found they couldn't keep the people within the bounds. Right, right. Uh, so 
What you get is the continual process, which has been classically expressed by Horace Greeley in the 19th century with the notion of go west, young man. All right? You can't make it here, pick up and move. All right? Pick up and transfer. The capacity of human beings to, to, re to start again by translocation, all right? to, uh, to try and re uh, recreate a life for themselves. Right? was built into this certain capacity of the human beings right? Right? that we can do it. The, the, one of the great differences between the Americans and Europeans uh, it, it has, it can be expressed in the, in the notion of a kind of can-do mentality. There's a kind of fatalism built into Europe given the conditions in which people find them in class structure, established traditions, um, uh, fixed limited capacities of land. There is a certain sense of accepting the conditions they find themselves in. Americans be, from early on developed the capacity that it's up to us. We can make something of ourselves. We can do it. It's simply a matter of the energy, initiative, and determination that one can have. There is that big sense in, 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 in the United States which has played such a dynamic role in mobilizing human activity and human expansion. Uh, uh, so that, that sense uh, plays a great role in the capacity that humans have, that Americans have generally had in the feeling that we can make a good life for ourselves and we can make a better life for our children. And that has, there's a deep sense of that. It built into what we have generally called the American dream. Right? That can do, can do, that can do mentality. And it, it was fueled also by the reformed Protestant tradition, which had so much to do in constructing America. It's roots in Calvinism. All right. uh, we'll go into a great deal to, uh, detail about Calvinism, but to put it in a kind of simpler sense, uh, which really is the religious basis of what we tend to call the work ethic. Right? Uh, the, Cal the Calvinist sense was that, and I won't go to the technical details of how this plays itself out, but ultimately if the, the, there's a deep concern with personal salvation and one can determine whether or not one is among the saved or not right, by the success one encounters in the world. Right? Uh, and so Calvinism was quite comfortable with the encouragement of business success and, the, and, and advancement in the physical world right, as a sign and proof right, of one's worthfulness, ultimately in the, in the Calvinist sense, in one's being saved. One can read that however one wants to read it historically. But it has given, it has given Americans a tremendous sense that if we accomplish things, if, if it's up to us to accomplish something, and if we accomplish it, we deserve it, and we have proved our worth. Of course, the negative side of that is if we have failed, then we, then we have somehow confirmed our worthlessness. I, that's how the notion of losing turns into being a loser. I always find it fascinating when you watch sporting events and, and you come to the conclusions of it. Uh, and I, I've mentioned this before, whether it's the Super Bowl or whether it's the World Series or whatever. Uh, when the game is over, there's a joy and celebration on the winning team and you always have this tremendous, you know, uh, coverage of the, of the losers in the locker room or on the field and the celebration, then there's this furtive step. They, they always break from that a moment to talk with the coach or the manager of the losing team. And that's you like, like in the hallway. Right? And it's always sort of quiet and subdued. It's almost like, you know, and, and, and the key thing is the effort to show that we have, they have nothing to be proud of. They have nothing to be uh, uh, spared about. They're, they really did their best. But there's this kind of moral sense that somehow there's something morally, moral failure involved in losing. That, that's the underside, I think, of the sense that, that it's up to us to make something of ourselves, and if we put our time and effort in, we can succeed, and if we do succeed, we earn it, we deserved it, we don't really owe it to others, we got it, we made it, and if we don't make it, if we haven't made it, that's, that's our own failure. No sense criticizing others. Right? We have failed. Uh, th th I've mentioned to many people in the past the, this brilliant book by um, uh, Jonathan Sennett and Richard, Richard, uh, Jonathan Sennett, uh, uh, Richard Sennett and Jonathan Cobb called uh, uh, The Hidden Injuries of Class, 
uh, and it's a brilliant study of the, it was actually sociologists in the 60s studying the white working class uh, immigrant community in the Boston suburbs and exploring there the relationship between the generations and the ambi- there the are a couple of themes that are central there which I think are very revealing to, to us in understanding America. One was the tremendous effort that the families had in, a- in giving their children a chance to make it in America and encouraging and wanting them to do so. Uh, uh, and then when the children were succeeding they don't, didn't want to be associated or identified with their parents because that, that and that the natives from Sicily and the et cetera, and the, speaking with that accent and having those those old fashioned manners, and there was this loss of generations and the and the parents really feeling that they were betrayed and the, and the, as the kids were seeking to make it on their own, making the world, but the other side of that was that they both of them bought into this notion right, that it was really that your success or your failure depended on your individual effort okay. And since the vast majority of people from poor, working class, or underclass situations do not have the same conditions of life as the majority of people, they tend to, to succeed far less well. And the numbers are clear. I mean, how many doctors come out of Roxbury, for example, right, or Harlem? Right? Right? You can always point to some that do, and that can be used as a sign that they could have made it if they tried, which we always hear in the, in the mainstream press. But the reality is the vast majority of don't, Right? Because there is a because of the of the tremendous limitations of the institutional apparatus and what is required for people to achieve success. Right? But the problem is that when if you buy into the notion that it's up to you to make something yourself, and if you don't succeed, it's your failure. Right? Then all those who, as it were, start with the deck stacked against them, clearly draw the, the psychological conclusion that there's something wrong with them, in some sense, the sense of themselves as being a failure. That, that book is a brilliant discussion of the complications there, but it does play into what's happening, I think, in America today. Uh, so, so I want us to think about that land of opportunity, which meant something. The, the, even the, and the religious and Calvinist sense, really that one's worth was proved by the success of one's efforts, Right? And that builds it into the country too. You know, God shed his grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. There is a sense in which the Amer- America has experienced itself as on a divine mission, whether it's the pilgrims, uh, uh, the, the, the Puritans, and Jonathan, uh, John, uh, John Winthrop speaking about us being a city upon a hill, trying to create a vision of the world, of a redeemed world. That's what he was talking about in, in, in his famous talk in 1629, right, about a redeemed world and that the, the, the mission was a salvific one. In fact, they referred to themselves, the Puritans referred to themselves as saints uh, and they were coming on a divine mission. But with that, that sense of the divine mission runs through American history. In the in 19th century, of course, it was our manifest destiny to move to, 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 to go to the West Coast. Right? Uh, and we've talked about you know saving the world for democracy. Right? That was Woodrow Wilson in, in, in World War I. There is a tremendous sense of this divine mission right? uh, and of the capacity of individuals to make, in some sense, to save ourselves, primarily individually, although in fact much of it was collective. One could never have gone across the continent in those Conestoga wagons if it wasn't a collective effort, but the vision is always continually of an individual accomplishment, individual opportunity. And, and the, there's a sense in which it is the resources of the country which made possible a tremendous sense of expectations and a tremendous sense of being able to make something of oneself, to better oneself, to pull oneself up by the bootstraps. Right? Some of the expressions which are big into, in American self-understanding. Right? That, that was fueled, that, that was made possible by a fantastically rich and fruitful continent and by a sense that of our rightfulness to that, you can even go back to the to the to biblical injunction taking over that God made the world and, and he made it for our our well-being and our benefit. Right? So that sense is built into American expectations. Uh, See, it's even fascinating the way that plays out in, 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 um, uh, in minority populations. Uh, the cl- one of the classic examples is Frederick Douglass, uh, who was one of the most brilliant 
uh, articulate spokespeople for the slaves, for the African Americans of the 19th century, for their rights and their and their possibilities. And Douglas is one who gave that fantastic speech in, in um, 1854. Uh, what what to the slave is the Fourth of July? And he goes on, in, in, and I won't go into details of the language in which he talks about how Fourth of July has nothing to do for the slave in terms of the, the oppression, the exploitation, the suffering that he, is, that he has been the victim of. And yet by 1883, Douglas is still, still speaking in the, in the sense of, of America as a possibility, a land of opportunity, and the people can make it. And, and he, he, was, he was himself, as all of us are in some sense are, uh, out of prisoners, victims, uh, participants, shared uh, contributors to the promotion of the American dream, a human opportunity, and what and what America has meant to the world and can mean. Right? So, so this American dream has many dimensions to it, right? but it is it is a, a practical sense that we have the resources, the capacity, and it's up to us to make something of ourselves, and, and we can do so, and we can reasonably expect to improve our conditions of life and the conditions of life of those of our children and, and their descendants. Uh, that, that sense was articulated most classically in the famous speech by Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893, where he, where he developed what is so called the frontier hypothesis. The notion that the availability of the frontier as a capacity for us to go west, to make something of ourselves, to start again, to, to turn our life, to, to if it failed here, to start and pick up and move elsewhere, that, that the existence of the frontier and the possibilities that it, made, that it offered to us was what made possible American democracy. Right? Um, Turner wrote that in 1893, uh, presented in 1993, in responding to a census report in 1890 which spoke of the closing of the frontier. The closing of the frontier. All right? And raised questions at that time about what effect would the closing of the frontier have on the American, our American democracy, he was focusing American democracy, on the essential traits and qualities of American life. Uh, and again, this is, going to, this is a short overall version of, it, of what could be discussed at much greater length. But it's not, I think, purely coincidental that the frontier was officially closed, according to the American census, in 1890. Turner presents his frontier thesis in 1893 about American democracy and the, and the dependence on the frontier. And that means they have the dependence on the capacity of the, of the society in, at large to grow in such a way that human individual aspirations could not only be reinforced but could be fulfilled. Because in order for us to be able to fulfill our personal aspirations for ourselves and our children and our family, we need to be in a society which has and develops the resources and the increasing growth of resources which, which make that possible whether it's geographical space, material well-being, and, and, and so forth. It's, it's not therefore purely coincidental, I think, that at the same time, almost, in fact, identically at the same time, right, that the frontier closes, for, Turner suggests that a frontier hypothesis, the United States begins its imperial adventure overseas. 1893 is the overthrow of the uh, Hawaiian government. Right? 1893. And you can, you can trace all of this nicely, by the way, there's a nice book called Overthrow by Stephen Kinzer, right, who was a New York Times reporter for many years. Um, uh, that's an interesting story in its own right. You would never have understood what he understands by reading his columns in the New York Times. You'd have to read what the books he wrote before he was in the New York Times or afterwards. But he wrote a book called Overthrow, in which he documents the American over expansion and overthrow of legitimate governments, beginning in 1893. 1898, we invade Cuba in order to liberate the Cubans from the Spanish and find ourselves carrying out, suppressing a guerrilla uprising in the Philippines as part of that process. Right? In the Philippines, suppressing a guerrilla uprising. Right? 1898 to 1901. Right? And then it goes on. We know perhaps of the uh, T Teddy Roosevelt's big stick policy, and you can understand you know, the extent to which we invaded, overtook, took over, overthrew, and run countries, whether it's Haiti, Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and one can go on to the whole Central America. And that goes on 
right? right on to the 20th century. Skinza documents in detail 17 governments since then that we systematically overthrew. Right? There are many others that we only participated in or supported and encouraged, like in Brazil or Indonesia. Right? Um, but that, and that was the process of expansion of empire. Right? That expansion of empire was the continuing on of the expansion of the frontier. Right? It, what we think of as the manifest destiny in the 19th century was imperialism on this continent. Right? And in the 20th century, it's imperialism worldwide. Right? It is building and expanding that capacity for growth, which fuels human aspirations. Um, again, there are many more, there's many more nuances that could be developed here. So this is just the brief version, as it were, the very brief version. Uh, but that continual expansion of growth, right, and the extent to which it, human, hu, human beings in America have come to expect and depend upon and have, in fact, our self-esteem and our self-respect to a large extent sustained and developed right, by our capacity to in, enhance our quality of life and to and, and to in, improve the quality of life of ourselves and our our uh, followers, our children and our and, and their children, right? And to as it would look toward the future in hope and expectation, right? which all presupposes the capacity of the economy and the society to maintain an increasingly expanding quality of life, as we understand it. Uh, and I and I, it's not simply the issue of democracy. I think Turner is a little wrong about that. But it is the expansion of enterprise. Democracy may have fueled that, it may impede that, depending on the situation. But what is crucial is growth, economic growth, the expansion of the capacity of society to produce the well-being and to make the possible and to open, and to leave the possibility in the space for individual self-realization. Uh, well, this expansion, without again spending a great deal of time on it, has increasingly now confronts a different kind of frontier. The frontier was not simply on, the frontier, the frontier of the of as understood in the 19th century, the geographic frontier of the United States, right? But it's the frontier of enterprise, of the capacity of us to expand our economic and political reach so as to develop and expand the well-being which makes possible individual growth and self-realization. That, that is now increasingly coming to an end. Right? There are a lot of dimensions of it, whether it's Nixon taking us off the, the gold standard in 1973, right? um, uh, or whether it's encountering the problems of global warming, right? or whether it's seeing the rise of first the rebellions in the third world, the Vietnam, the Vietnam War was a great example of the rebellion of the third world over our domination. It's not the only one, right? but it was a long and painful reminder. To the emergence of a whole series of economic competitors. We see the Chinese now in the process of, uh, of buying out or sustaining Europe from falling down and, be, and being our significant economic competitors, but so are the, so are the Brazilians. And so is the tremendous growth of India and the tremendous growth of China, right? And in fact, we even see in the development of globalization and the multinational corporations, they are no longer clearly, multinational corporations are no longer clearly um, uh, residents of a country, right? They are an international network, right? And when we talk about you know, shifting jobs overseas from the point of view of the corporation, that's simply a rational decision depending on the rules of the game. Right? If they can write the rules of the game, of course, then it becomes an extreme more rational decision. It's, it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that's um, uh, against their corporate national interest if, for example, uh, they, their jobs are done in India or Bangladesh. Okay. There's, there's no reason why they shouldn't be done under the conditions that they can exploit, or China even more. I mean, Walmart does most of its production, I think, in China. I know when I was doing this book and I was uh, dealing with uh, um, Macmillan, they, 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 sent, they sent the copywriting to India. All, right. I, I, the, all, the, all the book was the copy edited in India. 
very quick. I mean, they got responses back in a few minutes, <laughs> right? I mean, so the global uh, global network certainly makes that possible without any difficulty, and there are benefits. And right, I'm not really talking about the trying to evaluate globalization itself as a phenomenon at the moment. I'm trying to understand what is happening in America today. And what's happening in America today is number one, the rebellions of the third world. Number two, the emergence of economic competitors of extremely competent and 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 a competitive nature, whether it's in in under undercutting our domestic workforce or in out-competing us, as the Chinese, for example, are clearly doing on, on, uh, on, on fast trains, or the Japanese on fast trains, or whatever. Right? Uh, and of course, then there's the, the, then there's the global, then there's the, the, uh, the, the whole problems of the, the environment. You can only, you can't have unlimited growth on a finite planet. Right? I mean, it just seems sort of obvious at some point. Uh, uh, how that plays itself out is not always so obvious. Right? But I think increasingly now people are seeing, and experts are seeing, that these ex extreme, extensive, uh, uh, and, and, and unusual uh, uh, weather phenomena, whether it be, whether it be the, the, the unbelievable drought in, that is in, um, uh, in Russia, or the unbelievable rains in Pakistan, or in northern Australia, one can go on, conditions that are really quite extraordinary are also the same conditions which are more or less predicted by the global, global climate change models. Right? Uh, and, and in fact, it seems that the, these effects are happening more quickly than had even then been anticipated. Uh, the melting of the ice of the ice, uh, in Greenland or this, in the Antarctic. The, the Arctic is opening up now so you can, you can, you can practically uh, take a boat through the, through the Arctic in the middle of the winter. Never, well, not, not possible in the history of in, in written history's time, without going back how far. Right? So the environment, one of the fascinating things about the environment and, and about the natural world is you can't play around with it in terms of you know, making it do what you want to do. It'll do what it's going to do, right? whether you believe it or don't believe it. But increasingly, it's putting squeeze in all kinds of ways. I, I use the, the question of climate change as one, but I mean, you, ha you can only take so many resources and, 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 and transfer them into products and throw them out of the waste. That waste accumulates also in different kinds of ways. There are all kinds of waste and all kinds of ways. Again, it's getting out of time for such a discussion. The point is that the climate is rebelling about the capacity of the United States in particular, and in fact, the world in general to continually grow. There's a certain sense in which Western industrial civilization and our world industrial civilization, in a certain sense, is a 450-year Ponzi scheme. Right? I, I use that. To, I mean, think of it, because we have simply taken the natural world for granted. All right? We treat it as raw materials, natural resources, all right? and felt that it was in some sense unlimited. And that we, in fact, not only do we feel it's unlimited, that we give depletion allowances to oil companies because they're using up their resources. Right? 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 We should charge them for using up the natural resources of the environment. We shouldn't give them an allowance that's encouraging. Right? But the point is we've simply taken that as a, as a, as a free gift okay? and built our Western economic and standard of living from which we all benefit. Right? At least all of us here, anyway, if not all, everybody in the world equally, certainly, right? and assumed that it was given to us and that we could use it in a limited fashion. Right? But it's a finite resource. Right? And there are more or less subtle ways you can use it and get benefit from it. But it's a. And also, in a certain sense, you could say that the human species is a scourge on the environment. I mean, we are now closing 7 billion people. Present projections speak of the human species going within the next 50 years or so, or 100 years, to 9 to 10 billion people. Right? I mean, just trying to think of 10 billion people driving automobiles. Right? In fact, they found out recently, and this is a fascinating and a, a little perplexing thought, the Swedes were so good at tr moving from, to electric cars that they basically changed almost the entire fleet to electric cars in Sweden. And they found out that people were so happy with that, they were driving much more, and it was increasing pollution. Right? I mean, that's a sad, pathetic thought. If you think we're going to solve the problem right, of, uh, of, of global warming by moving to electric cars. 
Right? I mean, there are more fundamental problems like that. But the point is that all I'm trying to talk about is there are many ways in which the expectations that we've had upon which we've built our society and our personal life right, of unlimited growth. And America has pioneered that in ways which we are direct beneficiaries. That is coming to an end. That has been coming to an end over the last 30 or 40 years. It's, the way it does it, it works its way out, is, is complicated. And, and as a political struggle as to who's going to determine the rules of the game and how we are going to accommodate. I and mean, we're going to accommodate. I mean, the earth will not let us accom not accommodate in some sense. All right? But there are many ways to accommodate. All right? Some less desirable, some more desirable. All right? I mean, there have, been, there have been civilizations which have very rapidly collapsed. All right? The Maya, for example, within 100 years. And, and the population was cut, was, was reduced from, a, from what, in, in more than a half within a hundred years. Right? They're not the only example, I just saw that off as one example. It happened between 850 and 950 of the contemporary era. But that's only one example. You could talk about the Eastern Islanders, you could talk about the, the Indus civilization, the first Indus civilization. I mean, there's many examples. I mean, it's not only, I mean, uh, Diamond, uh, I forget his name now, first name, but he wrote the book called Collapse. All right? It talks about civilizations that have collapsed and why they've collapsed and others which have not collapsed and why they have not. And he's writing it particularly to try and suggest to us that we now understand processes which other civilizations don't understand. Right? So we have the intellectual capacity. We may not have the political will and the political capacity to understand the conditions which are squeezing us to which we will have to, we will adapt. The question is, how intelligently, at what time, with what consequences, for how many people? Right? But it seems to me that you, if you don't understand the fact that the American dream, as it historically was experienced, of continual opportunity and, uh, and expanding of, of wealth and, and well-being, right, is can no longer continue as it has. Right? What you find then is increasingly people who feel squeezed, who feel that it isn't the way it used to be, who feel that their opportunities are being squashed, that their standard of living is going down, right? and that the classic American response to that, which again, which is another theme to that Protestant tradition, is right, if, we, if this was land of opportunity, right, and it was, we were on a divine mission, the only thing that impedes a divine mission is the evil one, the devil. There's an historical struggle in America around the question of the nature of divine mission and, and then the, question, question, the nature of the, of, of the opposition uh, and the demonization of the opposition. I won't go into great detail about that either, but Richard Hofstadter grabbed that very beautifully in his brilliant historical discussion about the paranoid style of American politics. That's the title of a book he wrote, Great American Historian. There is a large tradition about that. The demonization of the other, it does a couple of things. One is it allows you to dispense with, your, with more concerns about how you deal with the other, it also absolves you of personal responsibility. Right? But that process of looking for, an ex looking for an evil one, I mean, we've gone through it. We, we, we've gone through it. The, it was the, the Japs and the Nips and the, and the, and the Krauts and the, and the Commies and the, and, and, the, and the drug lords and the, the Arabs and the terrorists. I mean, it was, used to be you know, the Indians. Right? I mean, there's a long history in America of having some you know, evil group around which we mobilize our energies feel ourselves on a divine mission and justify whatever we need to do to, to expand our enterprise. Right? Well, it's now becomes increasingly possible. It can be difficult for us to carry out in the same fashion. Right? And what has happened is that in America, historically, there's been a kind of understanding that we can expand our well-being and all ships will rise together. It's never been quite true, right? but there's been a sense in which you know, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. These days, that seems like a rising tide only lifts the yachts, right? But that's an interesting point because if we have expanding growth, we can deal with the problem of domestic turmoil and problem and opposition by sort of buying it off with the growth. So, you know, I'm doing very well, but you're doing a little better. What are you complaining about? But if the growth is not there, if the growth of the society as large is not there, well, then it invariably turns back on itself. Right? And those who have the power and the desire right, to continue to grow and live as they have right, need to extract it from the rest of us. 
And the rest of us must feel quite bitter, angry, resentful about what we are in fact experiencing. Right, now, the question is, how do we come to understand that suffering, that resentment, that anger that we are experiencing? Right, and that depends on how, how our consciousness is molded and shaped. And that's where the, the union, as it were, of the multinational corporate establishment with the religious right serves as a beautiful focus right, to mold and shape the consciences of resentment and anger right? so as to reinforce the established structures of power in our society. That, that, has a, that is a profound challenge to us and um, that's the framework I think to, to understand what is a fantastically deeply felt resentment in our, that's across the society and is in almost inevitable. In fact the first version of this chapter I wrote in, in the book here was written 35 years ago. And I talked precisely about the coming anger and resentment and, and, the, and the threat to which, and, and the capacity with which that can be under certain circumstances, mobilized in a certain kind of, in, in, order, in order to advance what you can only call a, a proto-fascist agenda, which simply means that the confluence of large corporations and, and, the mili and the military state, right, imposing from the top down, right, an authoritarian order in the service of those large corporations, right. I mean, that's basically what fascism is. We're not talking about Nazism. We're not talking about extermination. That, that you know, we're talking about what constitutes the, the, the corporate state linked to the mil to a military establishment opposing a hierarchical. Uh, top-down decisions in order to maximize the, the, the control of wealth and resources. Right? And you have to mobilize, you have to mobilize a, a segment of the, wor of the lower classes to be your stormtroopers of sorts. Right? To carry out that kind, the militant anger has to be mobilized. Right? I mean, that's, the, that's, what we, that's the, the challenge we face. And the question, in, in, in some sense, is twofold. Right? Right? How do we mobilize a counter movement to that? And how do we as a society come to terms with the fact that continual, the, the frontier is no more? The West is no more in that sense of the word. And that we need to reor we, we will reorganize our society on different terms, whether they will be corporatist, top down, and repressive, and authoritarian, or whether there will be other firms, that really remains to be seen. So much for my uh, remarks, uh, my, my effort to make some sense of American politics. Um, no, 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 no applause, no applause. Oh, thank you, please.